Hello, and welcome to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. I'm Chris Troiano, joined always by Stephen Canistracy. Hi. This is episode 30, and today we're speaking with Dr. Richard Berkmeyer, who's recently retired from the America's Brass Band. Uh, he was a B-flat cornetist and conductor of the band for many, many years, and we are super excited to have him on today to hear his experiences, both with early American brass research and also his time with the America's Brass Band. Yeah, it was great to get him on the show, and uh, we, uh, we're we happy that he took the time to, to speak with us and, and um, kind of go through the history of the band and some of the projects they've been involved with and, and the different stuff that they've been doing uh, to recently. So uh, we think it's a good episode, and we definitely think you'll enjoy it. If you like what you're hearing on the show, you can support us on Patreon and Teespring. We've got some physical merch up on Teespring and some other perks up on Patreon. So all the details will be on our website that's eabbpodcast.com. Uh, you can find us on all social media platforms as well as YouTube, where we don't only post the, the full episodes, we post some excerpts and some exclusive content on YouTube. So uh, give us a subscribe over there so you never miss anything. Um, yeah, and I think that's about it. I think that's the usual details we go through here in the intro. Yeah, so let's dive right in. Here is episode 30. Hooray, our 30th episode featuring Dr. Richard Berkmeyer. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Richard Berkmeyer, for coming on to the Early American Brass Band podcast. We're super thankful to have you on the show. So thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. So we like to normally start each episode by kind of going more or less chronologically kind of through our guests' experiences. So can you briefly tell us a little bit about maybe your musical upbringing and what kind of brought you to the the doorstep of the americas brass band <laughs> well i um grew up in the midwest and in wisconsin actually and uh went to the university of wisconsin did my undergraduate played in the marching band and uh played trumpet and majored uh in music education but then i went ahead and got a master's at memphis state in trumpet performance and mm -hmm. Uh, from there, I taught for a couple of years at a little college in Wisconsin called Lakeland College, and then decided I better go back and get a doctorate. So I always wanted to go to Northwestern because that was uh, the great brass school and mm -hmm. studied with Vince Chickowitz. And, and I was fortunate, got admitted and um, did my doctorate and then started teaching or at least the coursework and then started teaching at Ohio Wesleyan back in the uh, early 80s. And it was while I was at uh, living there in Delaware, Ohio, uh, a real close friend of mine um, was a Civil War buff. And in fact, his father was the biggest Civil War gun collector in the state of Ohio. Their oh, well. house was a museum <laughs> of Civil War, uh, mostly firearms, but also some instruments. Mm -hmm. And every year they had a big Civil War uh, sale up in Northern Ohio. And he invited me to come up one year because there was a fellow up there that that was really interested in Civil War instruments. Mm -hmm. And while I was teaching at Ohio Wesleyan, I actually had a young man come into my office and he brought a Civil War cornet with him. He'd found it in somebody's house and it was obviously an old instrument, but I knew nothing about uh, 19th century brass at that time. Uh, but I, I was able to convince him to sell it to me and I got it fixed so it would play. And so when I heard that there was this fellow who was going to bring a bunch of instruments uh, up to um, this sale, I took the horn up there and, and met him. And this was Mark Elrod. He invited me to come back that summer to Greenfield Village in Detroit, where he actually put together uh, a Civil War band and a couple of guys came all the way from Los Angeles, California, actually from Long Beach, California, to play in this. This Now, I was still back in Ohio at this time, uh, but that sort of got me really thinking more about 19th century cornets in particular. My doctoral dissertation was on 19th century trumpets, so it worked out <laughs> real well. Nice. And then, amazingly, the next year I was hired to teach uh, trumpet at Ohio, at um, Cal State Long Beach, which is where these two fellows had come from to play in Mark Elrod's band. So I got to Long Beach State in 1985, and there were students there 
uh, in my program who were already Civil War reenactors and musicians. Hmm. And they had instruments and all of this. And I was just absolutely astounded. And of course, they immediately invited me to come and play in, in their band. And it turns out that this was what they called the America's Brass Band. And um, so really from the time I got to Long Beach State in 1985 uh, until pretty much right now, I've been a, a member of that group. So Mark, uh, turned out that Mark was, uh, had been very helpful with the original founders of the America's Brass Band. I, I said I joined it in 85, but it had actually been around since 76. Mm -hmm. And it started right there at the university from students uh, who were in the band program. And they got a hold of Mark Elrod somehow. I'm not <laughs> exactly sure. Uh, but he helped them find instruments and get music and, and really get established uh, as a Civil War band way out on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, he really remained a, a friend of the band all of his career. Was the, the cornet that you started off with, that first instrument that you got, was that, uh, is that a marked instrument? Does that have any type of maker's mark on it, or are you not sure what that instrument is? It was a Stratton, John F. Stratton, E-flat, uh, what Elrod called it, a, key, a valve bugle, actually, because it's a really um, wide uh, conical bore and um, not a very good instrument to play. Mm -hmm. I played it a little bit. But as soon as I got out to the West Coast, they had much better instruments. <laughs> and I, uh, I played um, pinch tail and rotary valve uh, cornets out there, which are actually pretty good horns. Gotcha. And then you were saying that that being your first horn and then being with the, the America's group doing your dissertation on early trumpets, did you end up owning other early brass instruments or did you just kind of own the Stratton and then borrow any other instrument? Yeah, the band, um, after it started up back in the late 70s, they needed to get instruments. And so they started working summers uh, at Knott's Berry Farm every day at a, a regular band gig there. And all the money that they earned, they used to purchase instruments. And so they were able to buy antique uh, Civil War instruments right from the get-go and also music and uniforms and, and that kind of thing. Uh, the only other old instrument that I bought was actually a, an F trumpet, and that was what my dissertation was on. It wasn't on cornets, although I wrote about them um, in my doctoral dissertation, but it was mostly on, on the F trumpet, which was a low orchestral trumpet that was the standard instrument in orchestras in the 19th century in Europe. Hmm, interesting. And so I, I had one of those, but um, I didn't, I never really, the Civil War instruments got to be so expensive i couldn't afford them <laughs> yeah yeah that's for sure yeah. was the uh the f trumpet something that was ever teased in the u.s or did it not even come close to catching on here at all not really it um even the the few orchestras that that existed in the united states were almost all uh using cornets mm -hmm. and they didn't use trumpets at all um and of course the the wind players were all band musicians uh, in the orchestras in the United States, and for that matter, in Europe too. Most of the professional wind players were were first and foremost band musicians, and they brought their band instruments into the orchestra whenever they could because they were generally a lot easier to play. And that was certainly the case with the F trumpet. It was just an impossible instrument to to, to play at the high registers that a lot of late 19th century music requires. <laughs> So the America's Brass Band was kind of reformed, you said, in, in 1976, um, but it did historically exist. Um, can, can, can you know much about, you know, the historical America's Brass Band? Uh, we know as much as there is to know at this point. Uh -huh. um, America's is a, uh, a town in Georgia, real close to um, Plain, Georgia, which I know you guys are all young, but <laughs> President Jimmy Carter back in the 70s came from Plain, Georgia, a little dinky town, sort of put that part of Georgia on the map. And America's is the, the big city, uh, pretty much right in the center of the state. Back when the, the modern band started in 1976, the, the guy that was really uh, sort of driving the, 
the band was not a music major. They were all members of the band at Long Beach State, but he was an engineering major. Mm -hmm. And somehow he decided that America's Georgia was going to be where the band, uh, these were reenacting bands, so they had to have a Confederate or a Union or Confederate uh, uh, original uh, model to, to base on. So he actually took his wife on their honeymoon and they went to Americas and went to the library and found what little bit uh, they could about the original Americas Brass Band. It was formed in 1859, I think, or maybe 1860. Uh, the town of Americas was a big city at that time. It was a, a major uh, agricultural uh, hub, uh, cotton, cotton plantations all around it and about 10,000 people, about the same size it is today. Hmm. And so they, they had everything except a band. And so they hired a young uh, professional musician from Vienna. Uh, his name was Louis Zitterbart, and he was actually Czech, but he had a, a degree, if you call it that, from the Vienna Conservatory. He was a very fine cornet player. And he was uh, brought over here to the United States. He came with his mother. He was only 19. Uh, to start the America's Brass Band. And this was how town bands started all over the country in the first half of the 19th century. They'd find a professor, quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, a skilled uh, professional musician who almost always played the solo cornet and would come in and train uh, the folks in town to play uh, the instruments. Was, these were adult bands. They were not... Uh, there was no such thing as music education uh, in most of the United States at this time. Mm -hmm. And so Louis Zitterbart started uh, a band there in Americas, uh, bankers, and uh, there were a couple of musicians you know, from the town that played in the band, uh, business people, all male, of course, all white, of course. And um, within a year, it was a pretty good group. And of course, the war came right, came along at a about the same time. Mm -hmm. And so Americus uh, actually put together three companies of soldiers for the Confederate Army and, uh, and then had the band as the town band. And as these uh, companies all mustered into the Confederate Army, the pressure on the band got higher and higher to join as well. And mm -hmm. this is what happened all over the country, as you well know, mm -hmm. town bands enlisted with uh, regiments from their local area. And that's exactly what happened in Americas. Uh, Bob Wiebe was the founder of our modern band. He was the one who took the honeymoon to Americas and he went through all the local newspapers and found lots and lots of articles uh, that talked about the, the beginning of the band, talked about Louis Zitterbart being hired and the, some of the other members who were in the band um, I took a sabbatical to Americas um, many years later and sort of followed up a little bit to see if I could find any more information than what he found. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that all the newspapers from the war years uh, had been destroyed. Mm -hmm. that, oh, well. uh, in the South in particular, after the war, people just went through and got rid of everything that reminded them of that terrible uh, chapter in, uh, in history. Yeah. And so with, with the exception of one newspaper, the four years of the Civil War are completely missing in the uh, library there in Americas. I did found, find one newspaper from 1864 and it mentioned the Americas Brass Band. I guess they were on furlough from the Confederate Army and they were in town for the winter. And um, uh, Louis Zitterbart had, had put an ad in the paper offering music lessons to try and, and uh, pay the bills, as yeah. it were. Yeah. So yeah, we know quite a bit about the band. They uh, enlisted finally in 1861 with the uh, uh, 4th Georgia uh, Regiment, Dole's Brigade. And in fact, that became the name of our group, um, uh, the official name of the 501c3. And uh, they were attached to Lee's Army of Virginia and fought in every battle of, uh, that that army fought all the way uh, to the end of the war when the band was captured uh, at Sailor's Creek just 
a week before Appomattox, before Lee surrendered Appomattox. Wow. So that's sort of the original America's Brass Band as it was uh, constituted during the Civil War. Louis Zitterbart was wounded uh, in, uh, I think he played the bugle as well as play, directing the band and was wounded in action. Wow. Uh, but I guess came back and, and finished the war with the band. I'm not positive about that. Mm -hmm. uh, he sort of disappears from history. I really looked hard to try and find what happened to Zitterbart after the war, but uh, I've never really been able to nail that down. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Do you know, did anything happen with the band itself, maybe without the professor uh, after the war? Is there any mention of it becoming town band status again, or did it completely dissolve? Nope. It, uh, it, they came right back and, and took up right where they left off as the, as the town band of Americas. And uh, again, the newspaper record starts up right away after the war. And I was able to <laughs> track uh, uh, the next several couple decades, actually. And um, it's originally, it's still called the America's Brass Band for about 10 years. But then an African-American group uh, formed in Americas. And they took over the name America's Brass Band, and it was an all-black band. All the white musicians formed another group uh, associated with the Wide Awakes, which was a, a um, I think, a, an organization of firemen, for the hmm. most part, volunteer firemen, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of those social clubs that were so popular in the South. Yeah. And so in old uh, dictionary, or not dictionaries, in old uh, directories from America's, you find the Wide Awake Band, and then you find the America's Colored Brass Band. And I became more and more interested in African-American bands uh, after the Civil War because I often wondered where the connection is between concert bands as America's popular music in the 19th century and jazz bands, which is America's popular music in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And um, most of my more recent research has actually been in that trying to find that connection of through mm -hmm. African-American brass bands. And it turns out there were dozens, maybe hundreds of African-American brass bands uh, during reconstruction and later in the 19th century uh, that did feed directly into jazz bands in the early 20th century. That's interesting. Wow. I know in uh, Ken Burns's jazz documentary, when Marsalis talks about how uh, you know, the, the surplus of brass instruments and then the, the recently freed enslaved, you know, kind of was a little connection there with allowing, you know, the, the, the recently freed to have access to the brass instruments. But then I also heard a, a lecture recently about Winton. He seemed like he was crediting a lot of that kind of crossover period to Buddy Bolden. Have you have you kind of found that connection to be true also? Well, um, I've actually done a lot of research uh, and read a lot of research that's been done on New Orleans and from about 1880 uh, into the 20th century. And it seems like almost all of the trained African-American musicians come off, off the sugar, plant, sugar cane plantations uh, that during Reconstruction, many of the sugar cane, the large cane plantations down on the Mississippi River Delta uh, form brass bands for the workers. These were industrial bands, very much like the the British brass bands in the coal mines. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, many of the of the uh, plantations along the Mississippi River had brass bands, uh, all African American. And um, there were professional musicians from New Orleans, both white and black, who regularly traveled the plantation circuit by rail up and down the Mississippi River. And every week they uh, stopped at each plantation and trained um, the field workers to play instruments. And in many cases, the plantation owners purchased instruments for, for the uh, bands and uniforms and music. And often these bands came into New Orleans, uh, particularly during Mardi Gras and festival uh, to play in the parades. And many of the musicians uh, in New Orleans that we associate with, with jazz bands in the early 20th century came off plantation bands uh, from the 19th century. Yeah. They really start in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, and really become very, uh, very uh, important by the 1890s. And some of the smaller towns 
in the parishes around New Orleans also have uh, brass bands. Many of them are associated with the churches as well. So um, I, one, one uh, study that I read on, on brass bands around New Orleans in 1880 said there were 100 bands, 40 of which were African-American. Mm -hmm. And uh, Buddy Bolden, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. you know, there's been, uh, I think, one or two di um, uh, biographies written on him, but his background is very sketchy. It's very possible that he may have uh, learned on a plantation. Uh, so many musicians brought their band instruments when they left the plantations and moved to into the big city in the 1890s uh, for for work uh, on the docks. And uh, it's entirely possible that that, that was the case. Uh, I just haven't haven't heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there, you know, that I really haven't, you know, explored yet, you know, down that avenue. Um, and it's just fascinating. I mean, that obviously music, you know, pre-Civil War on plantations was a huge part of, you know, the life of the enslaved people. And then, you know, uh, horns and, you know, percussion instruments and stuff were like explicitly banned, you know. And then after after the Civil War, when, you know, obviously not a lot of freedom was granted, but some semblance of freedom was, it's just interesting that like, you know, those things were, were picked up on, you know, and carried through um and and learned and it's it's fascinating to see you know how it how it all works out and you know you like you were saying how like some some connections is just not really possible to make because the information's not there it's just i mean i feel like there was so much that happened then you know that it's just impossible to know for sure like who learned what where you know and all, all the influences that blend together are always really interesting <laughs> I know that you weren't there for day one in 1976 of the America's Brass Band, but do you know why they chose to to model themselves off of a Confederate band? Well, that's a good question. And um, part of it, I think, maybe most of it, had to do with the, the founder. His name was Bob Wiebe. He's an engineer. Uh, went off to work for uh, Boeing. In fact, he lives up in... Uh, uh, Seattle, I think, to, to this day. Hmm. He, um, he loved Civil War reenacting. And there was a group of Civil War reenactors back in the mid-70s here in La or there in Los Angeles. Uh, and they'd go up to Fort Tejone, which was a, an old uh, uh, dragoon. They called them dragoons in those days, an old cavalry base uh, in the Cajon Pass. Uh, north of Los Angeles. And during the 1840s and 50s, there was there were about 2,000 cavalry, uh, federal cavalry troops that were based there. And um, the, the fort's been maintained ever since. During the Civil War, of course, Southern California was strongly Confederate. And so that garrison was moved actually into Los Angeles to quell the insurrection. But the, um, the base has been maintained, and to this day, it's a state park right on I-5 heading north out of Los Angeles. And so back in the 70s, all the local Civil War buffs did reenactments there. And a bunch of the guys from, students from Cal State Long Beach were getting Civil War guns and going up there and shooting them off and, and having a good old time. Mm -hmm. These guys were also members of the band, as I mentioned, at Long Beach State. And so one day they decided to bring their instruments and play for the flag lowering ceremony at the end of the reenactment. And everybody had such a great time. Everybody else up there loved the sound and the musicians had such a great time that they just decided they would continue doing that. And Bob Weeby was really the one who did all the early research and they, they were doing reenacting, I guess, half the group had to be union had of half of them had to be confederate so yeah, yeah, somehow yeah. they wound up being confederates yeah i got you it makes sense <laughs> yeah i thought that that was a, an interesting connection i actually didn't know that southern california was heavily confederate i always think of maybe the california is a big state and being not from the west coast i have the the gross over generalization that oh san francisco you know that was you know, union with like Alcatraz Island and knowing, you know, that that union Civil War history there. I just assumed that it was all union <laughs> back then. But. Yeah, no, it was, they were strong. And 2,000 soldiers uh, 
uh, occupied Los Angeles in the city only had 5,000 total citizens, 90% of whom spoke nothing but Spanish. Oh, well. It was a very different world. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Yeah. I, I had no idea. That's really interesting. Were you, well, first of all, I didn't know that the band was, you know, appeared in the movies Glory and Gettysburg until, you know, Chris kind of sent me the, the, the document that we work off for these interviews. Were, are you in those movies? Were you part of those two projects? We didn't appear in them because they were filmed back east. Uh, but yeah, we recorded music, uh, what they call source music. And okay, because gotcha. of our connection there in Hollywood and some, uh, some uh, mostly balls that we had done very early on, back even back in the 1970s, uh, the band came to the attention of, of folks in the, in the um, television and film industry. The first thing that the band actually appears in was the North and the South, which was this huge Civil War miniseries back in the early 80s um, and then for I don't know for about 10 years uh, we were the go-to group in Los Angeles so when um, they want when they needed period music for glory uh, they called us up uh, James Horner of course did the music for that for that film and we went down and, and did a, a session uh, at Sony Pictures that was then used as uh, part of the dance scene in the film. Not, I'm not. Sh I, you, you see the band in the background of that scene, uh, mm -hmm. and I don't know what they used as far as uh, musicians for that. Mm -hmm. um, what they call a sideline, but we recorded the music for that. We we're supposed to have recorded uh, music for the big parade as well. In fact, we did record it. Uh, even overdubbed it a couple times uh, with with James Horner. Uh, and got a really nice recording, but this was back in what the late '80s, I think it was, or early '90s, before digital recording. Mm -hmm. And we record, uh, as I'm sure you guys do, uh, at A450. We play our instruments at uh, what they call Austrian military pitch, which is mm -hmm. the the high pitch that all these band instruments were built in. Mm -hmm. Well, we forgot to tell Jim, James Horner that everything we'd recorded was at A450. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to take the bands, this march, this parade march, and meld it directly into the theater or into the studio orchestra and mm -hmm. the Harlem Boys Choir. Uh, it's a beautiful scene, but he couldn't match the pitch yeah, of the yeah, band yes. to the orchestra. And so they had to re-record the, the march with modern instruments because it uh, they just couldn't make it work. Now, of course, nowadays, you just adjust the pitch yeah. electronically. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say they can't just adjust the playback speed by like, you know, 0.2 percent up, you know, for the orchestra and the choir. To yeah, I don't in. know why they didn't do that, but they didn't. They, they re-recorded it, and actually, Lauren Marsteller that I was mentioning was hired on this on the second session hmm. uh, to play, but uh, the rest of us were not. Interesting. Oh, well. <laughs> now with Glory or with Gettysburg, that was another strange story. Originally, that movie was going to be a made-for-TV movie done on the chief it was going to be called killer angels it was based on the the novel mm -hmm. and um we got called to to provide source music you wanted several um marches and of course dixie mm -hmm. and a guy drove out to the university one weekend in his car took out a portable tape recorder set it up outside because they wanted it to sound like a, an outdoor band. And we just put chairs all around. We didn't even go into a studio for it. And we huh. recorded until the jets would fly over because it was on the approach to Long Beach Airport. Huh. We had to stop, wait for the jet to land, and then we'd start playing again. And they recorded all this music uh, just out of this portable machine. And then we heard nothing more for huh. years. And then all of a sudden, Gettysburg comes <clears throat> out. It's been redone, uh, but they wound up using our, the music that we'd recorded, no uh, again, with another band then appearing on screen. And that band was the Saxon's Cornet Band, which was uh, actually founded by one of the co-founders of the America's Brass Band. His name was Bill Gay, and he'd left, um, gotten married and gone back to Kentucky. He had started this Civil War band back there. 
And they're the ones that appear actually in the movie with our music uh, as uh, the historical America's Brass Band. It really was uh, America's Brass Band um, marching at the front of Lee's column as they marched into Pennsylvania before the Battle of Gettysburg. Yeah. Wow. Was Glory kind of a, a similar story? Well, I guess it can't be as similar as playing around a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure exactly how we we did Glory. We we done the North and the South. That was. Uh, sort of a fiasco. That was just before I joined the band in 1985. Bill Conti was the composer on the North and the South. And the band had appeared in several episodes as um, on a, what they call a sideline, pretending to play. Mm -hmm. And then they called us into the studio to record some music, or at least that was what they were going to do. And then they wanted us to give them the music because they had to hand copy all the parts. It's just part of the union contract. So we did. We gave them all of our music. And then the so-and-sos turned around and hired recording professionals, studio professionals on modern instruments yeah. to play all the music. They, oh, well. they paid us off. They paid us for a, a, a session, but we never actually had any music in the North and the South. When we got the call to do Glory, we were skeptical. We thought they were going <laughs> to try and rip us off again. Yeah. But uh, that time we showed up at Sony Studios, James Horner was sitting there and we did the session and everything went great. And, and that sort of made our, you know, made our reputation in Hollywood. So with the, the North and the South, just to kind of get the, the filmography correct. So you guys didn't uh, appear on video or audio for the end product of the North of the South and then just audio for Gettysburg and Glory. Is that correct? We were in video on the North and the South. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, several yeah. episodes. It's my understanding. I, again, I wasn't out here when they filmed that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for Glory and Gettysburg, um, because those were filmed back uh, back east, and we're mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and we weren't willing to fly back east, and they weren't willing to fly us back east. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it's our music that's in both of those. Now we did a couple of other films. Um, one in particular, the most recent one, which was still about 20 years ago, it was uh, Disney's um, Hidalgo. Mm -hmm. And in that film, we recreate Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show Band. Mm -hmm. And that was filmed here in Hollywood. So mm -hmm. uh, the band appears in that. And that's our music as well that mm -hmm. uh, is um, heard on screen. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did a couple of television shows as well. We did several episodes of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman way back in the day mm -hmm. where we recorded the music and appear on screen. Mm -hmm. But generally when they're filming at a, at a distance, uh, the, the movie companies are not willing to, to uh, ship a band all the way there just for a quick scene. Right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It, it's interesting. We, uh, we interviewed Dennis Edelbrock a while ago and talked to him about filming uh, the soundtrack and the, the video for uh, Lincoln Spielberg's mm -hmm. Lincoln film. And he was saying how for the scene of them playing in the film, they appeared and they got the, the audio in that take also. So the, the actual video is of them playing. Is that a, a practice to your knowledge that's newer or less common? Like why, why do you think your experiences were different in that regard? Yeah, they just never recorded anything on a, on a outdoors like that because you have to get microphones too close. And um, so they always re-recorded the stuff in the studio. When we did the episode of Dr. Quinn, again, this was 25 years ago. Um, we recorded it ahead of time and then heard the playback while we recorded, while we filmed the scene. Mm -hmm. um, but no, all they almost always, at least when, when we were doing it, recorded the music um, and then, uh, or actually did the filming first and then recorded the music. When, when we did Glory, uh, I was actually conducting, uh, no, I wasn't, I was playing on Glory. <laughs> when we did um, uh, Hidalgo. I was conducting the band in the studio and I had the, the, the film in front of me with the band performing and I was uh, 
conducting with the music so that yeah. I would be in, so the music would be synchronized with the, with the, the video. Right. Yeah. That's good that they took that precaution because even like watching a film like Brassed Off or something like that, it's like that those fingers are not lining up with what they're playing. And yeah. on a movie, a movie where the subjects are a brass band, you think that they would at least line it up correctly. So it's nice that they did it for you guys. Yeah, I took a humanities class my the last semester, of my senior year in undergrad. I just needed a humanities credit and it was a class. Um, the title of the class was musicians on film so we'd watch all these movies you know where the subject is music or a musician and the professor was like now like when you're doing assignments for this class just ignore any time where the fingers or like the lips don't sync up to the audio because that is so common in these older movies just don't even mention it in your paper because it's it's pretty much irrelevant <laughs> so i'm glad to see that they they uh, at least took some precautions with uh you know the stuff that you guys did <laughs> and then we can get into the the recording project uh in a second here but i know in the liner notes for for the cd of the civil war music uh it mentions that you know again mark elrod here's the second time we're going to talk about mark elrod <laughs> mentioned that he helped with the project and uh provided instruments for that as well but uh that's what i recall in the the liner notes did the the band not have its own set of period instruments or reliable period instruments up until that point? No, actually we got the instruments much earlier. So I think oh, okay. when I put those in the liner notes, I think that was just a reference to gotcha, gotcha. much earlier. Uh, although we continue to collect instruments uh, mo most of the 40 some years of the, of the band are always looking for, for new good instruments to purchase, mm -hmm. but no, yeah, we got all the instruments by the time we did we did that. Mostly that was to thank Mark for the, that America's quick step that mm, he there you go. Uh, provided for us at the last minute. Mm -hmm. That recording was really helped mostly by um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Reynolds, who was the bass trombonist of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and a real mentor for most of the musicians in the band. He was a Long Beach State grad way back in the day. And then he taught trombone at, at Long Beach State all the time I was there. And so every time we did anything with Americus, we would ask him to, uh, to work with us. And he helped, really helped us get a, a handle on the intonation problems that those instruments uh, all have. And then he served as tone meister for most of our recordings. Hmm. Uh, in fact, one of his pals in the LA Phil, another trombone player, Sonny Osmond, was the engineer. Uh, for a couple of our recordings as well. So there's a real close connection with the Philharmonic. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a album. nice connection to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in in my doc doctoral research, I've been kind of outlining more or less like the history of Civil War reenactment bands, and that ties into recordings also. And, uh, you know, we have Frederick Fennell's Eastman recording in uh, 1960. Uh first brigade band put out a few we know empire put out their album in 76 but uh you know kind of the the big commercial kick for a very widespread uh or a wide uh, casted net you know for people to have access and be able to listen to this kind of music came from my understanding from both the uh the ken burns civil war documentary soundtrack and then uh this the the album I think eventually of your guys that came out eventually in 93, I believe, um, you know, it was just the, the mass consumer kind of way that people were able to hear these instruments and, and this music for the first time, which, you know, helped jumpstart, you know, the movement in a lot of ways that have you guys kind of found that that was the band's role kind of in, in the history of reenactment brass bands, you know, being out in Los Angeles, we're so isolated from, from the, the Midwest and I, the number of bands in the Midwest now is, is huge and they're great groups, but we're again, so isolated. We really, we did that CD for summit records and pretty much sort of forgot about it. <laughs> we um, occasionally will mar um, license uh, a piece or two from there. Uh, we'll hear it show up on, on a TV show or a, a documentary or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm very gratified that, that the CD did have uh, some impact uh, around the country. 
we really worked hard on it and uh and i think it it turned out very well and so yeah i'm glad to hear that that that's in fact the case we've done a couple since then too that that we've enjoyed um but we're sort of going different directions mm -hmm. in the last cds that we've done adding woodwinds of all uh, mm -hmm. of all horrible things and, <laughs> and playing music it's a little more post civil war mm -hmm. yeah. for sure kind of a covering more of a chronology right of the music of the time period or music mm -hmm. uh within uh the history of bands essentially in the, yeah. the country yeah so i i guess like the the empire recording you know is very successful you know empire is empire yes. but they were on the modern instruments there so mm -hmm. kind of you guys as being that next step of having uh an album put out of similar you know uh reputation or similar scope or reach you know but with the period instruments is mm -hmm. is definitely uh very influential when when you guys did the recording or also playing the gigs and stuff what was your relationship with period mouthpieces did you guys ever touch them or were you mostly on uh modern pieces <laughs> yeah because all, almost all of our guys are professional uh musicians and they really did not want to use period mouthpieces now i've tried when I got that little uh, cornet, that Stratton cornet, it had the original mouthpiece with it, and it was so different mm -hmm. than a modern trumpet mouthpiece or cornet mouthpiece. That I and I tried playing on it, but it just it was not going to work at all for me. Not yeah. and be able to play trumpet on a daily basis. Yeah. And so we just we did, made a decision pretty much early on, uh, right from the beginning that. We were not going to do original mouthpieces. And I know that changes the, the timbre. Uh, it, it's not a significant change. Uh, the old instruments are very easily recognizable in and of themselves. But if we were real purists, we, yeah, we would play original mouthpieces as well. And some people do. I know, I know they do. Yeah, yeah. We try to uh, when we can with our band also. But it's definitely an adjustment that has to be made. It seems like you know the bands that are primarily or were or are primarily made up of you know professional players who you know they're they're playing with the band as kind of like a second gig they, they're the ones who seem to tend to be on the modern mouthpieces because exactly what you said the players have to go back and you know play in a in a symphony orchestra you know on the daily well before covid obviously but because uh, so, mm -hmm. those those period mouthpieces are a lot different like when i looked at that I, it's been a while since i've seen that that uh horn that chris showed the picture of but like the rim is so so thin and and usually i mean they're, they're kind of chewed up a little bit you know once because they're because so, they're so old so and the mouth you know, can, is can super deep yeah, yeah the mouth is comparing super deep. It's, and I, you know it's going to change the, right. the way the horn sounds but yeah we just never did it yeah <laughs> Right, so so the America's Brass Band, uh, you know, has these these touring shows called Top Brass. Can you kind of explain what they are and kind of the, the reasoning behind why you guys started to do those? Yeah, we've actually been touring since the early '90s. Um, originally, we had a show, a Civil War show, uh, called Honor and Glory, which toured for Columbia Artists uh, for several years, and then um, we branched off into the Dodge City Cowboy Band which was um, something that we discovered out here in Los Angeles at the Gene Autry Museum, a photograph of a, a band of musicians, brass band, but with woodwinds now. Uh, and they're all dressed like cowboys. We thought, oh, that, that looks like fun. So we created huh. another show and toured with that back in the 90s. Um, and then pretty much the, the, I guess we got too expensive probably because uh, it's a fairly big uh, touring cast, about 19 musicians and actors mm -hmm. and such. Mm -hmm. um, so we switched over to concertizing more at that time and really sort of got back to our educational roots, uh, formed some educational shows and started doing school concerts. And, um, and on, when we're on the road, we also do uh, concerts at, uh, at high schools and middle schools and, and such. And because of my interest in, in trying to connect the Civil War to more modern times, uh, we've started a show where we do the first half Civil War and then change costumes and do the second half Dodge City Cowboy Band. 
Hmm. Then we did the recording for the Buffalo Bill Historical Society, again with woodwinds of the Buffalo Bill Wild West Band. And so then we added that music to our repertoire as well. And then most recently we've uh, added the repertoire from the ragtime era, ragtime and blues and jazz. Uh, and that would be the Harlem Hellfighters uh, band from World War I. Hmm. And so Top Brass was, the, the, the idea uh, was that we would recreate ultimately four military bands that were originally civilian bands that enlisted in times of war to support uh, the country. And, uh, and then the, the four band leaders that, that worked with these groups. So we start with uh, Patrick Gilmore and the Civil War, and then Corsuza. Corsuza's band was the United States Marine Band. So that wasn't a civilian band originally. And then we wind up with James Reese Syrup, who's the, probably the most famous African-American band leader who had a, a, put together a, a band for World War I uh, to accompany the 11th uh, Regiment from Harlem, uh, which was the first American unit to see action in France in World War I. Mm -hmm. And so Top Brass uh, actually has four different... Uh, eras that we recreate um, those three. And then we go take it one step further and add, have our woodwind players uh, switch to saxophone and we recreate Glenn Miller's uh, Army Air Force Band of World War II. Mm, so that's you. top brass. Civil you... War, Sousa, Intermission, James Reese Syrup and Ragtime and Early Jazz, and then Glenn Miller and Big Band. How do you guys perform that with in regards to like costume changes? Is does each band have its own costume, or you just do halves? <laughs> well, we we uh, we're trying to keep it as simple as we can. We, after touring with costumes and sets and and such for years, we really wanted to make this easy to do, mm -hmm. easy to fly with. So no, we don't. But okay. uh, we do have a a, a narrator uh, who is. Um, uh, also a jazz pianist and she changes costumes and so gotcha. we have her uh um tell the story of of the four bands and also sing and play the piano on the big band stuff and mm -hmm. um and then she's the one that everybody looks at and we just wear just straight black gotcha gotcha but we do use all original instruments we have three sets complete sets of instruments. So we have Civil War brasses, then we have late 19th century brasses, including uh, valve trombones and things like that. Hmm. And then our more modern instruments for the 20th century set. Gotcha. So oh, instead neat. of costume changes, you do the instrument changes, which, exactly. which is nice. <laughs> so since Top Brass has been uh, the show for America's, have they not worn Civil War uniforms since that show has been active? Right. Yeah. We don't use any uh any costumes at all we just wear black black pants and black top and and uh we let our our narrator do gotcha. that. Yeah. yeah uh what what's kind of been the uh the response from the education programs have you guys been seeing that people are interested in seeing that kind of spread of history or is there more interest in like the instruments themselves what what have been your observations with that well, we've, we've done a lot of educational shows and they're always very well received by the students and faculty. I'm not so sure they're so well received anymore by school administration. Hmm. I think anything that has to do with war in general and the Civil War in particular is somewhat suspect hmm. uh, in education circles these days. But I think that'll change. It's not going to be that way forever. Um, the main thing is that bands are American history and America's popular music was band music until fairly recently in, in time. Mm -hmm. And this is very appropriate music and culture to be bringing to students, being, whether they're at the uh, secondary level or elementary level or at the university level. And I know you're, 
your your doctoral dissertation addresses this that that this is America's history and um, it is the history of popular music, mm -hmm. and yet bands are being systematically ignored by uh, the writers of popular history music textbooks mm -hmm. and um, and all the classes which focus exclusively on songs, particularly from the 19th century and early yeah. 20th century until you get to jazz. There isn't any instrumental history. And of course, that's just simply not true that right. bands were everywhere, thousands and thousands of bands, hundreds of thousands of band musicians in the 19th century, thousands and thousands of pieces of, of band music published, music that's completely forgotten now today. And um, it's time to bring that back. The, the, the research that is, that is waiting to happen is just amazing. And um, I'm so glad that, that some of you younger folks are really interested in, in this subject and are doing something about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Why do you think uh, that time period and that, that style of music is getting the back seat in education kind of at the moment? I cannot even imagine. I, mm -hmm. I ask myself that question all the time. Um, I think part of it is publishers. Uh, Michael Campbell wrote the textbook that I've used for years and years to teach my history of American popular music class. It's an excellent textbook. And in the first edition, he had a whole chapter on bands mm -hmm. and Gilmore. Yeah. And in the last edition, there's nothing. Oh, Gilmore wow. is not even mentioned. Sousa is, or maybe Gilmore is a, is a footnote. Sousa is mentioned briefly and that's it. And I, I called Michael Campbell. I says, what gives? And he said, oh, he says, you know, you're right. He says, you're totally right. But my publishers made us take it out. So I don't know what that's all about. I, I can't even imagine. Uh, it's like nothing exists in the 19th century except the minstrel show and Stephen Foster. Yeah. Well, it's just such nonsense as to be right. beyond belief. But yeah, uh, it's crazy. And uh, towards the beginning of my my dissertation that I'm writing right now, I kind of open with saying how, you know, there's X amount of universities providing music degrees and, you know, X amount of those students play in the bands and they go on to teach bands and teach marching band and all this stuff. And their entire education is playing in bands and then teaching bands afterwards. But they learn about orchestras the whole time in yep. music history. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've gone into it on the the pocket, and I, so I won't be long winded again. But it's just, yeah, I, it, it's it's funny, you know, that like at least in the United States, and I'm sure it wasn't just the United States bands were the thing. Like like the orchestral tradition in the United States is fairly recent. I mean, the bands predate that. And a lot of those band musicians were the ones who were playing in the early orchestras anyway, like you said earlier. So it's like. I mean, and even I did my undergrad at, at Eastman and you have the Eastman wind ensemble there founded by Frederick Fennell. And I, there was not a class offered on anything band history or, you know, even really American music history that I can remember. And I, I do not think we talked about anything except for orchestra and opera in the, like the music history curriculum, which I mean, that that's a conservatory. So, you know, it's, you know, that's going to be the case. But even even I think at, I did my master's degree at Penn State, and I don't think the undergrad curriculum there included it. And there was only one class offered my last semester there that had anything to do with with band or wind ensemble history. So I could go on forever about it. <laughs> but, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but yeah. only one textbook on the subject and it was it had one printing. It was published by the Smithsonian, had one printing back in the 90s. It's out of print and nobody's written one. Of course, I'm as much to blame as anyone. I could have written a textbook on band history. Have I done it? No. Mm -hmm. ah, but well, you, you're you retired now. What, what, what are you doing now? Get started. I know. I can't <laughs> yeah. retired, right? I have no excuse anymore. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, I know that, uh, what, Schwartz right, wrote a book in the mm -hmm. 50s, I think, the Bands of America or Bands yep. in America. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that, there's that, that, some stuff and you know, there's some great stuff out there, but nothing in the last 30 years except for uh, Hazen. And yeah. um, <clears throat> oh my that's, a, that's a great book. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah, good stuff in there. But it's I wonder if like what bands if we're if there's a theme of kind of overgeneralizing certain topics. I wonder if the idea of just bands in general have been overgeneralized to include just marching bands and maybe people are like kind of sticking their nose up at marching bands and not wanting to teach the history of marching bands. So it's kind of excluded maybe for that reason. Yeah, good question. I, I, I just can't even, I yeah. can't even imagine. Time to change it though. Yeah. yeah. This is coming, kind of coming off the top of my head, but I think maybe because the, at least in the United States, it feels like, you know, if, if you're considered a professional musician, you're either, you know, talking to someone on the street they're going to assume orchestra or like pop musician because the bands are really dominated by the military bands which is primarily a service organization <laughs> so like bands are either military bands or you know college bands because when, once you get out of that i mean the only let's say quote unquote professional concert band or you think like classical band is you know outside of an educational setting it's either the military band or just like a community ensemble which the you know, royal hawaiian band yeah <laughs> <laughs> right but yeah I don't some know. Of... yeah it's it's an interesting it's interesting to, to kind of ponder why it doesn't ever really get the the press or the airtime I, I guess that we all feel it deserves some of our guys in america so went to work for disney and disney in fact, the, the solo cornet in America is the leader of the Disneyland band. And that hmm. is the only full-time professional band outside of the military anywhere, as far as I know. They should make a Fantasia 3, but instead of it being orchestral music, it should all be band music. <laughs> hmm. I'll write to Disney. We'll see if we can make it happen. <laughs> I'm biased, but I think I think band concert band music is a lot more accessible than, you know, going to an orchestra concert where you got to sit through, you know, well, I say sit through. I mean, I love orchestra concerts, but you know, you, you go through the first half and it's, you know, like two <clears> modern <throat> pieces and then a Mahler symphony. It's like, that's a, that's a heavy lift, you know, for someone to sit through, even me, you know, with two going on three degrees in music. It's like, sometimes those orchestra concerts can go on forever. I'd much rather sit, uh, sit through a band concert with, you know, eight or nine shorter pieces on it, you know, that you go through a, you know, more material than, than just three pieces, three super long pieces person so I guess you could probably go out of your way to like programming a dense band concert but like if you're kind of like going based off of what works you know and like the the precedent of band concerts before it you know you throw throw a few marches in there you know those palate cleansers can uh really increase the longevity of anybody's ears if you just throw a march kind of here and there so yeah <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to, to speak with us and, you know, share the, the history of the America's Brass Band, both the historical one uh, and the modern one. Um, wh what's a good uh, place to point listeners to if they want to find out more about the America's Brass Band or, uh, and you know, the, the CDs that you guys have recorded and all that stuff? Do you guys have a website and mm -hmm. Facebook page and all that? Uh, it is America's Brass Band, all one word, dot com. That's our uh, website, and uh, CDs can be ordered there. Our, our new CD, which is the 100th anniversary uh, tribute to James Reese Europe and the Harlem Hellfighters, has just recently been released. And Great. Uh, that's, that's something like you'll never hear. In <laughs> fact, uh, Gunther Schuller called James Reese Europe's band the, the first big band, the first jazz big band. Oh, wow. There you so, go. yeah, just check out. We'd love to have you on yeah. our site. Well, I just I just uh, compliment you and applaud you uh, for the work you're doing. I think that uh, certainly Americas could never have thrived if it hadn't been for the support of Cal State Long Beach uh, right from the get go. Uh, rehearsed there, concertized there. Uh, I always got support as a professor uh, to work with the band. Um, I know Gil Klein up at Humboldt State's the same. I know that the uh, Armory Band at Riverside College uh, has support from the school. If we can somehow convince universities that this is part of American history, an important part of American history, uh, that music schools uh, should embrace these kinds of ensembles. Uh, it's also scholarly, a very important uh, area that needs more research. And as you said, finally, students that learn this music will be able to 
continue to play in groups like this after college because there are community bands still everywhere brass bands British brass bands civil war bands I had no idea there was as many civil war bands as you have on your website yeah yeah and so there is a future after college and after high school for instrumentalists so I I wish you all the the best and all the success in the world with this project Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. We, we can't thank you enough for taking time of your afternoon uh, to speaking with us and, and sharing with us your experiences and uh, the history of America. So thank you so much. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you again so much to Dr. Richard Berkmeyer for coming on to the Early American Brass Band podcast. It was awesome getting to hear your experiences with early brass research as well as your time with the America's Brass Band. So thank you so much for taking the time and for everything you have done in the Civil War brass band revival movement. Yeah, we definitely appreciate uh, him taking the time to speak with us. Um, If you're curious about anything uh, we talked about in the episode, this is always a good time to point out that we have show notes for every episode up on our website at eabbpodcast.com. You can get in touch with us on any social media platform, as well as uh, you can shoot us an email at eabb.podcast at gmail.com and we'll have links to everything uh, that we mentioned um, in the show up on the show notes Uh, and there are a bunch of resources up on the website as well so we invite you to go uh, poke around and explore a bit Uh, maybe buy a book buy a cd and uh, do some research of your own this episode's featured album is that America's Brass Band recording that we mentioned in the episode, Music of the Civil War, performed on original instruments. This album was put out in 1993, though it was recorded in 1991. And as we mentioned, this is a very important album in terms of uh, spreading Civil War brass band music on original instruments to a wide audience. So be sure to go on our show notes and check out where you can listen to and purchase the Civil War, the music of the Civil War album by the America's Brass Band, as well as seeing links to maybe some of their other CDs uh, that is all equally great early American brass band music. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next episode. Thank you.